Thank you everyone for joining us for another Learning Lunch hosted by FormatApproved.com. My name is Brian Johnson. I'm the Senior Director of Online Education with Format Approved, and I'll be your moderator today. Today's Learning Lunch title is How to Win the ICD-10 Waiting Game. This Learning Lunch is brought to you by Medical Mastermind, a leading provider of EHR and practice management solutions. We're actually, we have two presenters for today's session, but they're going to go one after the other. So to begin, let's introduce Carolyn Hartley. She's the president and CEO of Physicians EHR Incorporated, a Cary, North Carolina-based company that serves as a coach and health IT project manager, assisting medical practices navigate through EHR adoption, stabilization, and HIPAA compliance. They also collaborate with professional coders to measure and contain productivity risk during ICD-10 conversion. Carolyn, thank you so much for joining us today. It's my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me, Brian. All right, and we'll have an introduction with Michelle, our other presenter here, in just a little while. Um, I'm going to move to the slide that shows our questions that we're going to cover today, but before we move on, let's just do a quick polling question, which is a kind of a fun way for everyone to interact. And what we're interested in this first question is what is your role uh, in the organization? So we're curious whether you might be a consultant, a provider, a payer, a biller, or other. If you'll take just a moment to answer that question, we'll see who we have on with us. All right, it looks like we're getting some good votes. I'll leave it open for another 10 seconds or so. It looks like most of you have already voted. That's great. Got a lot of uh, consultants I see and a lot of people who are other, so we'll have to maybe follow up with you and see where that is. I'm going to go ahead and close the poll and show you the results. So you can see the results there. We've got quite a few consultants, and I guess that makes a lot of sense given uh, ICD-10 and uh, where people are in trying to figure out how to move forward on this. We were talking before the event that I think a lot of people are now saying, what now, after the delay, and we're going to address that question in detail here today. All right, well, Carolyn, again, thank you for joining us, and let's dive in here. What do you mean when you say ICD-10 is a group activity, not an individual sport? Thanks, Brian. I appreciate that question. And I also want to say I am so glad that we've got so many consultants and and others on the call today because we really need your help in, in, in spreading the word about what we're doing in ICD-10. So ICD-10 is a group activity very much like Y2K was, and that is that nobody gets to go, nobody gets to do this first. Everyone is trying to meet ICD-10 at the same time. Let me give you an example. Um, for example, uh, an oncology client of ours, um, it uses an integrated EHR, but their additional software includes one for chemotherapy administration, another software for digital audio software, they use Excel spreadsheets, they've got a cancer-specific patient portal, and all of those interfaces have to come together in order for this one group to be able to, to meet ICD-10. They have their payers as well. So uh, the more that we work together, the, the, um, the better it is. And, and if you can go to the next slide, um, Brian, the cost, the waiting game that we found in our study was remarkable. And I, I want to address this uh, real quickly. Stanley Nockamson of Nockamson Advisors was the lead in 2008 who not only has been very involved in getting ICD-10 uh, information out to providers, but he also did a study in, in, in 2008 that said, well, let's look at the cost because part of the team activity is helping each other manage the cost of ICD-10 conversion. And then in, uh, in 2013, AMA came back to him and said, we need some help. We need some guidance in where are we going in 2014? Because in the next couple of slides I'll show you, we did some research on, on um, what are those real costs. You can download this report for free. It's a 25-page study. Um, it's available on our website uh, right there on the front, or you can go to Nockamson Advisors and download it from them as well if you're a member of AMA. And, and Carolyn, this way. 
You, yeah. I'm sorry, your website is www.physiciansehr.org, is that correct? Uh, it's .com and .org. .com. That's yes, correct. okay, great. It's, it's .com, it'll get there, No, you, you'll get there no matter whether you use .com or .org, but thanks, Brian, I appreciate that. I just wanted so to make sure everybody knew. Terrific, thank you very much. And in the next slide, what I'd like to do is to highlight some of the costs that we that, uh, that the Nockamson Group had identified in 2008. We didn't. We really weren't deeply engaged in EHRs at that time, and so the costs that were provided um, through that first study included content from organizations like WEEDI and studies from AHIMA, studies from CMS, um, studies uh, from uh, MGMA, who played a large role in this, and, and, uh, and then our own research. And you can see at the bottom line, if you'll just click it again, Brian, you'll see maybe the 83200 and uh, sorry, go back, <laughs> the $83,290 for a small practice uh, compared to a typical medium practice, and these are the costs that we identified in 2008. But now, Brian, if you'll go to the, the next slide, take a look at the cost comparison when we got to 2014. We knew a lot more about the cost of training. We knew a lot more about the cost of doing a gap assessment. We knew that the, that the vendors, the EHR vendors, were so dedicated in 2013 and 2014 to trying to meet a number of things, meaningful use stage two, 2014 certification, and ICD-10, um, and making, uh, you know, making sure that they could meet all the clinical quality measures, but also including the fields for ICD-10, but making sure that they also train their physicians in clinical documentation. So that was an enormous amount of development costs some of them, the vendors tried to absorb themselves, others of them they had to pass along, which is a big part of the team activity. So the process has already been put in place to transition to 2014. And if you'll take a look at where we are, you know, in 2008, we thought that the small practice would be right around 80,000, 83,000 or so. But now we've we've gone up at least $30,000 to $130,000 more for a small practice. And for a medium-sized practice, we're talking about anywhere from $213,000 to $825,000. So if you are doing the math, waiting has cost us an enormous amount of time, an enormous amount of money, and that's just in the costs that are due to the, um, to the providers. So the big message that I hope that our, our listeners will take back to their customers today is waiting another year is what we have to do. But if you wait until the last minute again, these costs are going to come back and bite you. We've had calls um, you know, early b before Congress said, OK, we're going to put it off for another year. We had calls from a bank that said, listen, you know, our, our clients, our hospitals, are asking for anywhere from $30,000 to $20 million line of credit in order to be sustainable through um, the next three to four months. Guys, we cannot do that. We don't have that kind of resources within our country, and we cannot wait until the last minute to pull off ICD-10. So we want to focus on that, uh, especially today. So next slide, Brian. If we can talk also about another cost that we revealed, this is also included in this study. Uh, if you look at the percentage of claim lines denied, and this is the percentage of claims, not the amount of revenue, but the percentage of claims that were denied. In 2013, um, you know, we've been going up and down, and you know, some years have been better than others for a number of reasons we're not going to get into right now, but in 2013, Congress, or excuse me, CMS said, anticipate this number to triple. And so that was part of what we're, our major concern was, is that we're not ready for ICD-10. OK, give us another year. Because we also, we can't go out to our providers and say, you know, ex expect your, your denials to triple. So 4 to 5% denials. Um, is is an, an outrageous amount of lost revenue. So in the next slide, Brian, let's talk a little bit about 
uh, the comments that we got from interviews from interviewees. Yeah, so tell us uh, more about what, what you learned from those interviews. Yeah, in our 2014 study, Brian, uh, one of the things that we did is went out into, you know, did an environmental scan, but also talked deeply into, uh, researched deeply into what some of the other organizations who routinely ask questions like, where are you in ICD-10? And we pulled those information together. And then we did in-depth interviews with uh, practices and spent anywhere from 30 to uh, 45 minutes with each one of their practice managers. The number one comment that we got from providers was, there's nothing about ICD-10 that makes me be a better doctor. And I know that the listeners out there are nodding and saying, yeah, we get that too, you know, nothing in ICD-10. And then other comments which were kind of, that pretty much informed AMA and also informed um, some of the other decision makers about where physicians and providers are thinking, some of them said, well, we have SNOMED in our EHR, so we're already ICD-10 ready, which is not true. But the other one is my EHR company mapped our ICD-9 codes to future ICD-10 codes. Great. Use that as a great stepping point, but you've got to do your own homework. So if you're a consultant and you are working with your, with your clients on mapping the codes, you cannot depend on a, on a simple, on, on a map to get you from the ICD-10 to ICD, uh, from IC9 to ICD-10 without really drilling down into what this practice really does and how they stay um, in, in business. One of the ones that, uh, one of the comments that, um, that generated a lot of media activity was, well, we don't have a budget for ICD-10. <laughs> and that was the driver, that was one of the main drivers that, that Congress and, and that CMS looked at as well and said, are you kidding? We've been talking about this for four or five years, and you have no budget for ICD-10? Well, how did you think we were going to get there? So to our groups, again, to our billing groups, to our consultants, you've got to go out and help your clients build a budget. This isn't something that's going to happen for free. They've got to be able to plan for it. And we'll show you a little bit more about how that's going to be helpful to you. And then for the HIPAA question that really startled me the most is to have people say, well, we don't really keep an inventory of software systems. Well, um, so how, <laughs> I mean, you know. You really should. <laughs> What? <laughs> and and you uh, you went off to uh, you know claim your meaningful use funds and you don't have an inventory, which is one of the uh, you know things that's uh, that's you know that's required in your meaningful use gap analysis or in your um, you know in, in core measure number fifteen. Right. So how can you track where where ICD ten are unless you've got the software system? Well, before we move on, I just want to mention to our audience that if you do have questions for our presenters, we're going to get to those at the end of this session. But you can go ahead and put those in now as we proceed, and we'll, again, hold those. But you can ask those at any time, and we'll save them for our presenters. So, Carolyn, let's – yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, who, who benefits from ICD-10? Well, you know, what most people know is not the physicians. So let's talk about who the other people are who win. Well, CMS is going to win because it helps them with some fraud and abuse and detection. Um, and, uh, and they can also manage some disease outbreaks. Homeland Security is, is a winner because they get some, they're going to get more detailed information about, uh, about uh, viral uh, outbreaks and, uh, and protecting the, the nation. Um, in one of our recent webinars, we had a member from the FBI who said um, that healthcare and disease management is a major area of inter interest. In, in fact, it's one of their five core measures for 2014 and 2015. Um, pharmaceutical companies are going to benefit because uh, you know because they get safer, more. Uh, detailed clinical trials, and they get better information about drug effectiveness. And then, and then the hospital and billing system manufacturers are winners because they understand that time is money, and so they're trying to uh, make sure that they get most current systems for you. But you know, the last thing is, you know, where's the provider in all of this? Well, let's go take a look at how the provider is going to win. So then, there you go. Thank you, Brian. And so in the ICD-10, what are some of the wins for providers? Physicians are great collectors of data. 
And most of that data they use intuitively to make clinical decisions. So, you know, this drug didn't work so well for this patient, okay, might not refer that one again, or, or man, this, this drug uh, mix, or this uh, clinical uh, process, or these workflows, or these, um, these treatment plans worked really great, so I'm going to use them again. But what ICD-10 does is it helps us consolidate hard data so that now we can make even more decisions about where are, what can we do for our patients but also there's some pretty cool revenue streams that are evol that are available for our providers for example it acts it, it provides uh, reliable data for research for epidemiology studies for clinical trials and we're seeing a lot more uh, uh, pharmaceuticals going directly to their doctors and inviting them to participate in clinical trials and when you've got ICD-10 uh, codes that are available, you get so much more in-depth research than, uh, and feedback than what was just available only in ICD-9. And pharmaceuticals are trying to, uh, are trying to um, learn more about your prescribing habits. So they want to know, did you prescribe this medicine? How is it working? Were there any adverse effects? Because they don't want to have FDA come back and say, you know what, you guys didn't pay close enough attention to these adverse effects, and now we're going to be, you know, we're going to be doing a really big in-depth investigation, and you know, you guys shouldn't have let this product go to market. So that is a real key um, indicator, great reliable data. And then for clinical measurements, so, you know, what treatments are working better with my patient population and why? Not just, you know, it's working, but, you know, in chemotherapy especially, uh, we do a lot of work in oncology, chemotherapy wants to know all that deep detail stuff. They want to know, um, you know, is this mix working? Can I, can I add adjuvant therapy to make it a little bit more complex? And e or easier for the patient, or you know, how many, um, how how much um, antiemetic should I put into the, how should I mix them together so that I'm not making our patients um, nauseous just because of the chemotherapy mix that um, that we're pulling together. And then there's the performance measurements. And you know, when it gets right down to uh, being in the physician practices, uh, doctors want to know, how am I doing? And their performances are based very much on how they're doing as well. These messages, you know, these are the things that our consultants can take out to, our, uh, to their providers and learn a whole lot more, help the providers learn a whole lot more about the benefits of ICD-10. Because no, it's not going to help the doctor be a better thinker on the front end, but it's going to help them be a better planner on the back end. And let's also take a look about where, should, where providers should be on ICD-10. This is a timeline that I hope that our consultants will really drill down in and, and use this to say, no kidding, no more, no more time. Um, you know, there's, you don't have, you, don't, you gotta, you, you bit the, you know, we dodged a bullet, but we don't have time to wait. So here we are, May 20th, and um, let's go to October 15th. Start the chart reviews now because the doctors are adding, you know, our, our billing providers are adding more clinical documentation, and that's the weak spot in ICD-10, clinical documentation. It's got to be supported um, by ICD-10, and so if we can really help our providers drill down into, am I, you know, am I doing this enough? And you know what we found from our providers who are already doing testing in ICD-10 is that the clinical documentation um, is really similar to what they did in, uh, in medical school, and that some of the early uh, adoption of ICD-9 and the, uh, the, previous, the, the previous clinical documentation kind of made the providers dummy down their, um, their documentation, and ICD-10 is going to let them get back into what was familiar with them uh, as they went through their, um, their medical training. You've got to do the risk assessment. So you're doing the risk assessments. You're doing the, you're building the milestone charts. In other words, you're not, you know, not the patient charts, but you're building your own milestones. Milestone, we've got to, you know, complete the the gap assessment, and then we've the next one is we've got to build a budget, and the next one, is, the, the next milestone is we've got to train our physicians. So your milestone charts are the ones that are going to help drive you and keep you on track. Your project management plan, build a budget. 
and use the study as a guideline for how much should we be saving for, and then delight your customers when your budget comes in under the, the, um, the study. Then the payer updates. You know, the payers have already pretty much done a great job of getting ready for ICD-10. They've spent billions of dollars getting ready for ICD-10, and now they're waiting for us to catch up. So you know, the, the more we can do for health IT system preparedness and doing end-to-end -end testing. Now, folks, end-to-end -end testing takes a year. And so if, you know, if we started with end-to-end -end testing uh, you know, in, in January, we're already six months behind. So get your end-to-end -end testing in place. Make sure that it is on your milestone, it's on your project management plan. Many of the hospitals are way ahead of us on this one, too. And then your provider training. So provider training is an ongoing experience. By the time we're really diving into the real ICD-10, and I know CMS wants us to really, you know, don't push anymore. Just get going on the ICD-10 and make it happen in October of uh, 2015. So make sure you've got your providers training. I think our coders are great. Our coders are doing a wonderful job. And, you know, with that team activity, we've got to make sure that they don't lose too much. So on our last slide, Brian, what I'd like to do is just to the, the five critical steps providers should be taking now. So get your, it, taking that, the timeline and drilling down into, okay, here, here's what you're really going to do. Do your risk and your impact assessment. You've got to find out where your, where your weaknesses are. Identify those interdependencies. You remember when I was talking earlier about the, um, the oncology practice and all the interfaces they had, where their inter interdependencies are, uh, where their interdependencies are? Uh, very much like a PHI gap analysis. You know, in the early days of HIPAA, we kind of went through all of the practice locations and tried to find where, where is PHI located. You do that same thing with ICD-9 and with ICD-10. Where is it located in our system? Where does it leak? Where does it, you know, where is it, uh, where is it being passed? Is it getting down into our patient portals? Is it in our interfaces? Um, is it in our system? Uh, did, did we hire someone to build some interfaces that are just for us only, only for our system? Is it in there? And you know what? You can count on it. It is in there. And mitigate those risks. And then identify those gaps in your systems. What resources are you going to need? Are you going to need? And then manage. How are you going to manage your denials, your prior authorizations, and what are those audit areas that uh, that put you at risk? For example, in the middle of your ICD-10, could you manage to have um, a meaningful use? audit uh, come your way? Could you do an OCR audit? What are those things that are going to penetrate your system that are going to divert your attention? We already talked about building a practical budget. And the, the 2014 study will help you with that because we've broken down uh, those um, you know, 25 pages. It breaks down each of those areas and say, this is, this is the thought processes that we went through in order to determine what the costs were going to be. Build your milestone chart with work breakdown structures and conduct chart reviews. Goodness sakes, that's a, that is so famous right now. That is, uh, that's what some of the EHR uh, vendors who are progressive thinkers are doing right now. They are going back to their own customers and saying, let's do a chart review and make sure that you are ready for ICD-10 because we've already spent thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars getting ready, we want to make sure that you're ready with us as we go um, into uh, the, or the 2015 date. And then start tracking your ICD-10 clinical documentation. Anytime there's a need in healthcare, the, the, the market is right for supporting our physicians. And so there's really cool software tools that are available now to say, let me take a look at your clinical documentation. I will evaluate that and tell you whether or not you'd be able to uh, complete bills, uh, complete your, your, um, your billing based on, on how you documented so far. Uh, we could provide a little bit more information about that later on. So with that, um, Brian, I thank you so much. And um, you know, I think I'd like to get a little feedback from the, uh, from the participants. All right. So, you know, we've got a number of questions from people, so we're certainly going to keep Carolyn around to answer your questions uh, in the second half of our presentation. I believe we have a polling question for our audience now. Is, is this the place for it, Carolyn? Yes. All right. Let's go ahead and share that with our audience, see where people are at, and what they see as the biggest challenges in moving ahead with ICD-10. So if you could go ahead and Weigh in on that question. 
Um, a number of you have asked whether you'll be able to get the slides from this presentation and see the recording. Rest assured that we'll send out a follow-up that gives you access to both of those things, so don't worry about that. We've got great questions from our audience already, so thank you for that and keep those coming. As I was saying, we'll certainly keep Carolyn around and get to those questions. Uh, earlier, people were answering, uh, you know, when they checked other, what was it? And it was a really interesting mix of people. We have some people from regional extension centers and, you know, people who are overseas uh, working with ICD-10. So really an interesting mix of people. So we look forward to addressing your questions. All right, I'm going to give it just another few seconds if you haven't voted already. If you don't vote, I guess we'll count your vote as other. I see a few more votes coming in. All right, uh, if you haven't voted, here's your last chance. I'm about to close it. All right, well, let's look at the results then. So, Carolyn, what do you make of those results? Yep, uh, it looks like things haven't changed too much. So we've got a, a great audience. Physician adoption has been, for a long time, one of the biggest concerns. I'm really hoping that we can leverage our um, our our audience today to influence them to in, in, in what some of the benefits are. Lack of interest in ICD-10, oh, man, I... I mean, I immediately commiserate with you. We've been beat. We've been beat up with IC10. You got to do it. You got to do it. You got to do it. And I know CMS had the huge, huge heartache of saying we're not backing down. We're not back, backing down. And then having you know this this lizard come in at the last minute and say <laughs> you are backing you know, down. Okay. Right. Yeah, you are backing down. So you know it it um it it kind of um, minimizes the impact of that, but um, I think you'll hear a little bit more from Michelle about, uh, you know, what we can do with ICD-10. All right, well, with that, we'll, again, we'll come back to Carolyn for questions, but let's introduce Mich Michelle Boucher of uh, Medical Mastermind. She's the Vice President of Marketing. She's a leading expert in high technology marketing with more than 25 years of experience in software, hardware, and consumer products. Michelle, thank you so much for joining us today. And I, I'm learning quite a bit every time I listen to Carolyn discuss any topic. It's certainly informative. Indeed. I couldn't agree more. So let's go on then with our presentation. Uh, what are you getting at with this slide? Well, you know, this is really dovetailing on what Carolyn has, and, and really the industry has been saying. It's almost... Uh, you know, with those statistics in your poll, it still shows that this is really kind of a catch-22 scenario where it's delayed because, you know, ICD-10 has been delayed because people weren't ready, and then the delay means, hey, I don't have to be ready yet, I can wait some more, you know, um, back burner it again. And I have to tell you, I did a Google search just for the heck of it uh, on ICD-10 because you know any article and we've all been i think inundated with articles about icd10 over this past year and certainly uh, the articles have not let up there's not one single article out there in the 19,800,000 results that google gave me that tells you to wait and you know it kind of sounds like it's beating a dead horse but i just want to reemphasize that because for the physicians who are not ready and for those who, who may still think it's okay to put it off, we're going to talk, and I'm going to give you the practical application that's going to focus in on where the rubber meets the road for the physician, and that is in the coding end of things. Now, I am not a coder. I am not a biller. I'm a marketer. But we have a billing service, and we certainly have many billing clients, and we've, we've done our homework on this because our ICD-10 solution uh, is, is, um, uh, is very thorough and comprehensive, and we've spent thousands of man hours and thousands and thousands of dollars preparing this, uh, just like every other EHR vendor, so that we can provide something that's really usable. So with that, let's get into some of the practical applications I want to share with you today. And, you know, you will get this PowerPoint deck. So if you're keeping track of these things, and I highly recommend that maybe you just make your own checklist as it applies to you, you'll get this in a follow-up. So let's talk about accounts receivable, Michelle. Uh, how can providers protect their accounts receivable? Yeah, and you know, with the numbers that Carolyn provided us, those are frankly pretty scary numbers. 
I mean, if I were if I were a, a physician, I would be nervous to say the least. That you really do have to take seriously the potential cost of doing this. The good news is that you now have a lot longer to mitigate those costs and or to spread them out so that the impact to your business is not quite as significant as it might have been had we had to go forward this October. So here are a few best practices um, that our billing service is not only implementing internally for our clients, but is also recommending to the client base that we have. So starting now, you need to act as if. So act as if ICD-10 were right around the corner and practice. So what you can do right when this session ends, you can start coding to the highest possible level. And um, I know a lot of folks use these, there's a lot of unspecified codes in ICD-9. So you're going to need to dig into that a bit. And the specificity is going to become an issue, you know, for a lot of specialists because of the number of ICD-10 codes you're going to have to understand now. So what I want to do for a second right here is just pause. I want to read you just a brief piece of an article written by CSI Coding Strategies for HBMA to this point. And in this article it says, although the ICD-10 CM codes still contain entries for unspecified codes, Medicare has indicated they are considering not covering services submitted with these codes. So this makes documentation and assignment of the appropriate ICD-10 code much more important. So they give an example here. They say, let's look at a diagnosis for 430 subarachnoid hemorrhage. In ICD-9, there is one single code for all the subarachnoid hemorrhages. In ICD-10, there are 20 diagnosis codes. Each one represents a specific artery and laterality of that artery. So the physician now has to go through 20 codes to identify the subarachnoid hemorrhage code for the specific artery involved. And payers will expect this information to be available in the patient's medical record and used on the claim. So that's just one example of, and I hope you understood all of that information because some of it's Greek to me because I'm in marketing, remember. But I, I know that what they're speaking to is the level of detail that you're going to need to now go to and the level of knowledge you're going to need to go to, which goes to point number four. So, you know, professional coders are good at this, but look, the billing staff needs to really understand anatomy and physiology because part of the ICD-10 codes include those things. And now is the time to give yourself the opportunity to brush up in those areas so that when the physician codes to those specific points, you understand whether or not it's correct. And then item number five, dual coding. Um, if your vendor does not provide this option, and we're going to talk about how to find out about that, one of the things you're going to want to be able to do is dual code uh, up until the time where you must move to ICD-10. And it's just going to help you get more familiar with the code set for your specific practice and identify those codes that you're not using currently. So just to review all of these things, the dual coding is going to help you get comfortable with starting to move to ICD-10. And I know in our solution, we provide a place for the physician to play around with ICD-9 to ICD-10 dual coding and to really understand how it's going to correspond so that you're not caught at the last minute trying to figure it out and uh, uh, elongating the cycle of billing. Well, I would have to think, Michelle, if I could just jump in, that that's going to demonstrate in real concrete terms that there isn't the one-to-one -one mapping between ICD-9 to ICD-10. So it's really going to show you, I think, where the process is breaking down and you need to make adjustments as you get ready for ICD-10. Absolutely. And, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that in the next slide, too. And one other thing I'd add just is that when it comes to educating uh, staff, there's also the need to educate physicians on those documentation needs, uh, you know, that there needs to be that higher level of specificity in the documentation because otherwise the billing staff can't provide the specificity that ICD-10 requires. So it's really training across the spectrum of everyone who's going to be touching these codes, even if they're not touching them directly, um, even if they're only touching them through billing. Right. You, you bring up a really good point, Brian. 
you know, there are a lot of articles that uh, anybody who's been doing any reading and keeping up with ICD-10, they all point to education for everyone. Uh, every single person in the office needs to understand what ICD-10 means to that office and how to use them and how to identify um, whether or not they're being used appropriately in whatever their role is within the practice. So from the receptionist to the physician, everybody needs to understand ICD-10. So this is a on? yeah, this is a oh. great question for you, Michelle. Um, you know, when it comes to interacting with their vendors, what should providers sort of ask or even demand of their vendors around ICD-10? You know, it's funny. If you go Google top ten things to ask your vendor about ICD-10, you'll get about 150 things. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I would say, you know, this list comes from a culmination of, of, of things, but mostly it comes from what we want our physicians to know. And so really the basics, what is the solution? You know, the vendors have been planning on rolling out their ICD-10 solution to meet this deadline if they haven't done so already. So they know the answer to this stuff. You may not, and so it's very important for you to go down this list at least you know, uh, you're on your own to see how much of this you really know, because it may not be important uh, 16 months out from the deadline. But as you start to dig in, and as Carolyn's timeline points to, you're going to need to know this stuff before rather than after you need to. So, what is your ICD-10 solution? Um, is, does it cost anything? So, you know, and that's one of the questions down below, but we found that people are really surprised that they may have to pay for this. Well, you know, as a vendor, the investment of time and resources it takes to become ICD-10 ready, let alone meaningful use to, which is a whole nother topic, <laughs> yes. uh, they need to recoup those expenses, that investment somehow, some way, and you really don't want them to be put in a position of not being able to continue because they can't um, uh, you know, um, recoup the investment they've made in bringing their technology current. So, yeah, you may have to pay for it. But, it's again, it's part of the expenses that Carolyn outlined, and um, that was taken into consideration in the study that they did. So when will your ICD-10 functionality be available? Um, the sooner the better, of course, so that you are able to practice and get familiar with it. And this is the one area that you alluded to earlier. Are you using lookup tables like the GEMS um, uh, mapping tables? Uh, or will your system provide the correct code? You know, systems should not provide the correct code. You need to do that yourself. But the ability to find the correct code can go much deeper than the simple GEMS um, mapping tables because they are not complete. And they may or may not. Uh, provide you with enough information for your specialty. Um, some solutions, some EHRs, gone beyond that. Um, we provided our own lookup table that actually goes beyond what GEMS is able to do and assists the, uh, the physician or the biller who's ever using it in really pinpointing what code they need to use because it's, you know, there's a lot out there, and if you and if you're looking at codes that have never been used before in nine, and now you need to use them in ten, that's one of the ways that you can do it. So you really need to understand how you're going to find this stuff. Um, how much longer will it take to code a super bill? Are you going to be adding layers of time onto your billing? How many steps will it take? Um, how do you prevent invalid or clinically inaccurate codes? So this is stuff that the vendor should have, will have thought through, and they will either have provided a way to manage this, or they will ex be able to express to you how you're supposed to be doing it. Will you support dual coding? Not everybody's going to support dual coding. And what dual coding allows you to do is, is, is simply that, be able to submit with 9 and 10 codes, because who knows what payer comes over when, and that's a whole other part of managing this transition. So you don't want claims kicked back because you've not have the ability to submit in dual coding. What support and training are provided? You know, there might be a charge for additional support and training. Um, you'll need to consider that and whether or not you need it based on how much preparatory uh, effort has gone in on the clinical side. You still may need 
some support and training from the vendor because how do you get to those codes? Where do they show up throughout the entire system? And, uh, and how do you manage through you know, understanding and learning how to use them? We address the cost. And then what is your ex external testing strategy? So if testing, if end-to-end -end testing, as Carolyn mentioned, takes a year, has that been started? What's going on? Um, have you participated in testing that's already been available? Uh, how will I, and then there's, you know, there's a myriad other questions. How will I know when my payer is transitioned over, et cetera? So this is a starting point. Uh, it's a discussion that I would urge everybody to have with the EHR vendor and make sure that you understand where they are in terms of the answers to these questions so that you don't get caught um, unprepared in these areas. All right, Michelle, well, what are some things that providers should do now? And I guess that, you know, if there's a theme to all of this, I think really uh, planning is the centerpiece of everything you and Carolyn have been saying. So what, sh what should they do right now? You know, there's so many um, tools available for any person at any point in the ICD-10 timeline um, to use. There, the one thing that I think this industry has been really good at, and particularly the vendors, is providing resources so that you can get this stuff done. So number one, you need to get everybody trained. Folks have got to know what they're looking at. They've got to have an understanding beyond how to find it in a, in a lookup table. Uh, they need the deeper understanding of how am I actually going to apply this to my day-to-day -day work. So certainly education is on the top of the list. Uh, you know, we just went through the whole HIPAA compliance thing with Windows XP. And I think a lot of people got caught short on April 8th and April 9th. So confirm that your IT systems are, are up to par and that you'll have what you need. Perhaps an ICD-10 version of your EHR is going to require some hardware changes or software changes or network changes. Uh, talk Again, talk with your vendor all of this stuff is, are things that they have already thought through and understand. They just need to make, you just need to make sure that it's communicated to you. Um, start ahead of time, months ahead of time with dual coding. And the physicians, you know, there's great specialty training by format approved and, and just for the physicians and just for their specialties. So that you can understand as a, as a doctor what it is you need to know. Take it, so take it now so that you can speak intelligently to your billers and the rest of your folks when they also take their training. Um, you know, the gap analysis, the workflow issues, uh, every place that ICD-10 touches throughout your practice, as Carolyn was indicating earlier, you have time to do this now. It may not be something you ever tackled before. The consultants know how to do it. They're good at this kind of thing take advantage of that, um, and then have a plan to handle the denials that come in. You need to talk through that, maybe talk to all of your providers or your major providers and find out what they're, where they're at with it. So, you know, lastly, don't be like those two lizards biting each other. You have a reprieve. We have to use it well. We have to be proactive with it. And if anybody ever finds an article that says it's OK to wait on ICD-10, please send it to me, because I have yet to be able to substantiate that as a viable option at this point. I have never seen such an article either, Michelle. All right, well, here is uh, contact information. Of course, you're going to get all of this in the follow-up. To, the, uh, to this event anyway, but if you want to jot this down, uh, Carolyn or Michelle would be happy to talk to you either via email uh, or Carolyn's got her phone number on there as well. I'm sure you could call up uh, Mastermind and talk to Michelle as well. Um, so do jot those down if you'd like, but before we go into questions and answers right now with our audience, we want to ask a final polling question. Um, just to get a little bit more feedback from our audience, and then we'll address the questions that you've asked. So here's just a little bit of uh, information about how today's event may have affected your thinking about ICD-10. So if you have a moment to vote, we'll just see where people are and if uh, they've had any 
changes in their thinking. I know Michelle really values uh, feedback of this kind on these events so that, you know, uh, if it's good news that uh, really was very helpful, that's always good to hear. But also, you know, if there's other things that could be addressed that maybe didn't get touched on, that's always useful as well. All right, we've got quite a few people voting. I'll give you just another maybe 15 seconds to vote, and then we'll take a quick look at the results before we get to questions from our audience. So if you'd like to vote, please do so now. And I'm going to close the poll in just five more seconds. All right, well, it looks like everybody's voted who would like to, so let's go ahead and look at the results quickly. So a lot of people have clearly, you know, put a lot of thought into this, and so it sounds as if this event confirmed their approach, but there's others who it's clear have, are already realizing that they may need to speed up their planning on, on this. I don't know if you'd like to comment on th these results, Michelle, or just reflect on them later. Well, I'm kind of surprised that, that somebody actually is going to wait till 2015 to pr begin preparing for it. I go for the negative first. But, I, you know, that's fine. There, there may be a compelling reason that you need to do that. I would just recommend that at least, at the very least, uh, get educated on what you're going to need to do at that point in time. And then, you know, I'm glad that so many folks seem to have a roadmap that they're following and, and that they're already in, you know, uh, uh, moving down that, that path. Um, the fact that there's a few folks that want to accelerate, good for you. I think that you, you get it. Um, you know, look, we're not trying to shove it down your throat. We're just trying to remind you why this whole thing was postponed in the first place so we all don't end up there next year. Because the one thing I do want to say, and I would love to hear Carolyn's response on these polling questions, you know, as a vendor, the time and preparation it takes for us to accommodate our thousands of clients in the transition to ICD-10 can push back uh, months before we're able to get to you. So if you think that on October 1st of 2015, you just turn a switch and it's done. You will be months behind just in terms of working with your vendor on getting this to work for your practice. So I really just caution against assuming there's any kind of a cushion that, um, you know, that you'll be able to work with as we get closer next year. Yeah, and Michelle, I'd like to add to that. You know, when we did a ICD-10 workshop uh, last year, we did a, a session with Format Approved. Uh, one of the findings that we uh, that we got is that many of the uh, providers were going to be waiting until first quarter and maybe second quarter of 2014 to really jumpstart their their ICD-10 program. Speaking to the timeline, I got to tell you that January, February, March until the, uh, and, and even up into April, was a nightmare for those of us you know, who were in the ICD-10 preparedness event because providers were calling and saying, well, I'm here, <laughs> help me. Right, right. <laughs> and we were saying, but the person who just called me said, I'm here, <laughs> help me. <laughs> so. So you know, it's so I I really sympathize with um, all of the all of the smart people who are listening today because they're trying to keep the they're trying to keep themselves paced well as they're going into 2014 and um, and we just need to make a stronger case to the providers to let them see that there's additional benefit and it's not just a, it's not just a public health um, opportunity for CMS to do the ICD-10. All right, well, let's get to a couple of quick questions. We don't have a lot of time left. I want to remind our audience that if we uh, do run out of time, well, actually, I can guarantee you that we're going to run out of time because we've got great questions. We're going to share all of your questions with our presenters today, so they will contact you um, and provide written answers to those as appropriate. Um, but here's a great question that I think may be on many people's minds. When you talk about end-to-end -end testing, what exactly does that mean? 
let me start on that one, Michelle, and then you can uh, back it up. I see uh, the the end to end testing is complete testing of all of your 837 and 835 transactions, and that is in full production. You'll probably need to have a testing company who comes in with you, but they are testing to see what's going to be uh, what is going to go through to your payers, and so all of your team members, you know that uh, that that full. Uh, team sport. Everybody needs to participate in end-to-end -end testing. Correct. And, you know, we were able to do a bit of it last March, but it wasn't end-to-end. -end. So, uh, you know, from the mapping to system configurations to internal processes, um, communication with the providers, um, whether or not a claim is going to get paid as opposed to just accepted. Um, you know, one of the things that, that we're able to do on our end is we're able to watch a claim go from submission to payment and testing that with ICD-10 at least from the physician's perspective. That's going to be important and that's why you need to start months earlier. Here's a question. Uh, we have a gentleman on the line who's from the UK or at least has work professionally there. And so it's kind of a comment and then a question about how to, uh, I guess you could say, to sell ICD-10 to physicians. I'll just read his comment. He says, the only way to get providers on board is with a benefits plan. In meaningful use, the incentives gave the basic expected benefits, yet most practices uh, did not bother with the professional projects or are now at risk of coming unstuck with stage two. How do you quantify the ICD-10 benefits in the U.S. system in the NHS, uh, I believe he's speaking of the UK system, it was easy. And he, he spoke in another comment about um, being involved with ICD-10 transition in the UK and commented that it went well. Um, I'm, maybe Carolyn could address that. I, I'll, I'll take a lead on it. And, sure. Um, and that's a really great that's a really terrific question. We actually studied a, a little bit about how London implemented their ICD-10 and learned that, you know, while we said in the United States that we should plan on maybe, uh, you know, 12 to 15 hours or so of training for the coders and also for the providers, London's uh, research said, how about 70? 70 hours, and so we took a real lesson learned from the people who have walked this path before us. So I, I appreciate, you know, in the United States we don't have the same, uh, we have a, a, a much more complex payer system, and so uh, for the benefits of, of ICD-10, I think we have to go outside and look for a more creative revenue streams for how will ICD-10 benefit the providers. Um, we've got a, a dynamic pharmaceutical uh, uh, industry in the United States, actually worldwide, but in the United States, who is interested in um, efficacy. And they want to know, is, are, are drugs working? Sometimes in the ICD-9 world, we don't get that, uh, we don't get that clarity that we can get in the ICD-10 world. So, um, you know, my, uh, my immediate response is the benefits are not all together uh, for, for on the provider side. They're not all together found in the, um, in, the, in the reimbursement cycle, but if you'll step outside of the reimbursement uh, processes, that's where additional benefits will be found. All right, well, I think we have time for one more question, and this question is around ICD-10 codes. Part of it is, you know, just to confirm this, people can download the entire ICD-10 coding set uh, for free from a number of different locations um, if they want to look at that coding set. Um, but the question is, when is the soonest you can actually use the ICD-10 codes and not have them rejected? Is this going to be, you know, a sudden transition on October 1st, 2015? Or is, you know, can people use them early? That's a great question. That's a good Michelle that's question. Have, yeah, that's, that's going to have to do with your providers. They're not taking them yet. However, if you're dual coding, that's the purpose of using dual codes. And, you know, you're going to have to check provider by provider if your vendor is not offering any kind of assistance in uh, provider testing. Um, you're going to have to check with them as to when they're ready, and and Lord, I hope they're not all waiting till that one day to turn it all on, because that would we know there's going to be a big mess. You know, there's going to be an adjustment period. Let me just put it that way. Um, from October 1st, 2015, uh, probably for the foreseeable several months, in getting everything straightened out. 
uh, they don't. The providers are not waiting. I mean, the payers are not trying to. Um, they're trying to mitigate that as well. So they will be accepting dual codes at a certain point in time. You just need to check with each one of them, at least your bigger payers that you, you know, the ones you're using most often, to find out what their plan is and what their schedule is. There is no one specific date for everybody. And considering the number of payers out there, um, we're, again, we're fortunate we have more time than necessary, perhaps, to really understand what that timeline's going to be. And they, look, they're going to let you know, they're going to let CMS know, as soon as the payers moved over, there's going to be resources available to find out. But if you need to be proactive about it so that you can internally work with your payers and not have these claims rejected, then that's something that you want to be, uh, you know, you want to be in control of that not happening for you. Well, I, yeah, I think uh, one thing that's safe to say is you will not be the first person to ask your uh, payer or your vendor about these things. And I think that's another theme that's emerged from your comments today is that, you know, planning is key, but also communication, uh, both internally and with vendors and with payers, is absolutely essential. So you've got to kind of have the right questions to ask and really map out that landscape of what you can do to get ready. You know, your payers should have a blog. I mean, and sorry, not payers, excuse me. Your vendors should have a blog. And in that blog, there should be plenty of ICD-10 information in terms of how it applies to their customer base and their product. And if not, I would seriously think about, you know, where you're getting your information from um, and make sure that that vendor is up on things. But there's a lot of resources out there, including Carolyn, uh, including blogs like ours, and including you know ICD-10 Watch. There's a million things out there that can keep you up to date. Subscribe to something. Well, remember that uh, we're going to send follow-up of this session that's going to have the recording and the slides. And uh, if we didn't get to your question, don't worry about that because we'll include answers to that in the follow-up. Um, I wanted to point out, you mentioned before, Michelle, that uh, we, there's a partnership between Foreman Approved and Medical Mastermind. Um, to offer training out, so we're happy to extend that to all of the people in today's session. If you are looking for ICD-10 training, you can go to www.medicalmastermind.com slash resources slash courses, and if you use the discount code MM20, you can take a 20% discount um, off of the retail price for that training. So there's training for coders um, that's very detailed. If you're not a coder, you definitely do not want to take that. But there's also training uh, for providers that's uh, really focused on pragmatic documentation guidelines. So that would be useful, I think, for people who are consulting as well to really understand how ICD-10 is going to change the way that clinicians uh, document. I want to thank Carolyn and Michelle for joining us today. This is a great session. I know I learned uh, a lot here, and I sort of swim in the ICD-10 sea, so uh, I, I know it was useful to our audience. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, you're welcome. Our pleasure. Thanks for inviting me to participate, both you, Brian, and Michelle. Thank you. It's always fun, especially with you, Carolyn. <laughs> thank you. Well, I'd, I'd also like to thank all of our attendees. Again, we're going to send out a follow-up with the slides and the video recording. Finally, you can visit formatapproved.com to learn more about our upcoming learning lunches. These learning lunch sessions are always free to the public. Uh, there's a button there on the home page that will take you to our entire slate of upcoming webinars where you can learn more and register for those events. Uh, keep, your eye, keep an eye on your email box and our home page for those upcoming topics. And thank you again for joining us today.